Hello, boils and ghouls. Welcome back to the Horror After Dark podcast in the sack with JT. Now, one thing, I think this is the first time in all the movies that I've talked about on this channel the last two years that I'm starting with the sequel and not the original. I've never done a video on the Amityville Horror. I think it's a classic. I really like that movie. But I, I prefer Amityville 2, The Possession. And two, the reason I just decided to make this a podcast, and this is the same way the podcast started, and it has no set schedule, just like anything else, was having a headache one night and watching a movie and saying, I still want to talk about this, but I didn't feel like recording, like sitting up in front of a camera, and boom, podcast. So it's Saturday morning right now at like a little after 10 a.m., and I mean, I'm still recovering from last night <laughs> But I went to throw something on, and I saw Amityville 2, and I said, that's what I want to watch right now. And it's a movie I've always wanted to talk about. So this is why I'm doing a podcast on it instead of a visual video, which is the same shit. You just don't have to stare at my face. Now, this is directed by Damiano Damiani, and maybe that's why I like this movie more as a big Italian horror fan. This movie feels very Italian, and it because it's directed by an Italian director. There is some weird shit in this movie. You have the whole thing with the brother and sister and, like, the weird incest stuff between them. But unlike the first original film, this story centers around the actual true-life DeFeo murders that happened in the house before the Lutzes moved in and concocted their whole bullshit story that became the book and the movie. You can believe whatever you want about it, but Amityville Horror has been debunked, beyond debunked, for a long time now. But the DeFeo killings absolutely happened, and of course, this movie is very loosely based on it. It revolves around the murders, but nothing that happened to this movie was happening to this guy. So without further ado... Let's get on to Amityville 2, The Possession from 82. That kind of rhymed. Also, by the way, <laughs> I just said in the video last night of Possession, I do this every time purposely. I live 10 minutes from the Amityville house <laughs> on Long Island. It's 10 minutes, 15 tops from me. And I do have a very short video on the channel somewhere. You can use the search bar of me trying to take some footage of it it's basically me like covertly trying not to get arrested walking <laughs> around the block while smoking a cigarette and having the camera pointed behind me to get a shot or two of it and then walking back that block facing it but if you're interested in seeing the house like nowadays I mean, you could see it in any other way, but if you want to check it out check it out oh and that's right I'm watching the credits Tommy Lee Wallace wrote this who's directed Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, the It miniseries, uh, a few other things, and he's written a whole bunch of stuff. Totally forgot that he, he wrote this film. Oh, side note, the first movie that I saw when browsing on this early Saturday beautiful morning and said that's what I want to watch and talk about is Dead Silence by James Wan and Lee Waddell. And I completely forgot I've done a video on Dead Silence. So that put a damper on that. And then the next one that I immediately said, yes, that's the watch, is this one. Just thought you might want to know. So we have the Montellis that are moving into 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. The infamous house that was never haunted. Now, like I said, even though this is heavily inspired by the DeFeo murders that actually happened, they changed Everything. The names. We got Anthony and Dolores, the parents, and Burt Young, right? He's the guy who played, I know that's not his real name, too, who played Anthony. He is one of the just most scumbag fathers ever put to film, which means he gives a pretty good performance. And Dolores is the wife. Sonny is the son. Patricia, we got a young Diane Franklin in this movie. And then fuck if I remember the names of the other two kids. So they move into this house and they're happier than pigs and shit. Also, where did that phrase originate from? Any pig experts out there? Are pigs happy rolling around in shit? 
I, I never understood any of that. And this is so random. But I had to ask. And I like how things immediately start happening in this film compared to the first one. I'm not saying I don't like the slow build and the atmosphere of the original. I said I love that film. But as soon as they move into this house, within the first 10 minutes or less, you already see Dolores turn the water on and blood starts coming out of the faucet. Like, they're instantly seeing things and are being affected by the evil force in this house. All right, so let's talk about incest. That's probably not the best way to start it off. But there is the relationship between... Patricia and Sonny, brother and sister in this movie. That is very strange and weird, and I don't know why it was put into this movie. It's Italian, right? It's because <laughs> the director's Italian. But I think it also has to do with probably their chemistry on set. Maybe they liked each other so that you see more attraction there, even though it is part of the story. You know, that they have that scene together and presumably, like, have some sort of sex. But when you first see them moving in and she's, like, putting her arms around him, it feels way too over the top. So I've always assumed that they just probably had too much chemistry and went way overboard, thinking, all right, we have this weird feelings towards each other and we got that scene later, and they just went a little overboard with the acting. But it's not like a big knock on this movie. This stupid shit I hate in every movie that does this. Sonny comes downstairs and scares the shit out of his mom after she felt like somebody touched her, but no one was down there. So she's like hyper-focused and looking in the room. Uh, then Sonny comes down, bumps into her. She screams and is like shaking. And he has the balls to say, Ma, sorry, did I scare you? Fuck you, movie. One thing I just love about this movie is the score, the cinematography, the way that this movie just looks and it feels. The feel to this movie is so out there that for me, it makes it feel more demonic. What's happening to this family? compared to the first film. But there's still a bunch of shit in this movie that makes no sense. So this is a very well done scene where they start hearing loud knocks at the door late at night and Anthony and Dolores come downstairs and he opens the door and there's nobody there. Which, the last knock is a split second before this guy opens the door. How is there any explanation for that? Where did that person go if it was a person? Which, of course, it's not. But whatever. He shuts the door, and then the bangs start again, and he runs and grabs his shotgun, which is cool foreshadowing of the shotgun. And then chaos breaks out up in the kids' room, the two younger ones. And it looks really good with the paintbrushes coming out of the paint cans and, and they start moving and start painting on the wall. The windows are going up and down. But I, always, I say this with every movie <laughs> that's demonic possession or demon infestation or ghost movies. Why do they have to do this? Why do they have to always do such small acts of bullshit initially in the the haunting or possession, before they can finally take this person. Can't they just possess Sonny, like, right off the bat? Why are they painting shit on the wall and moving, like, chairs around in other movies, plates and stuff like that? Like, is there a reason? Do they have to do, like, a certain amount and hit a quota of, like, funny pranks and scary pranks to play on human beings before they can infest someone. I'm not a demonologist. If you need one, call Ed Warren. But wait, you can't, because he's dead. But if you believe in demons, maybe you had personal experience, maybe you're a psychic, you can talk to the dead, hit up Ed Warren, and find out the information. But then the parents get up to the kids' room, and they see the full painting on the wall, which is creepy, but that's supposed to be a pig? Because it says, Dishonor thy father, pigs. And in the first movie, the girl saw the pig in the windows, the eyes and stuff, which it sucks that they changed the original windows like a long while ago, decades maybe, 20 years ago, of the actual house. Because when you go there now, totally different windows. But that's supposed to be a pig, right? Because it looks nothing like a pig. It looks like more like a 
alligator, like, mixed with a dragon. I could see some aspects of a pig there, but that's not a fucking pig, man. And that scene continues to get very, very chaotic and tense. And this is where the family starts trying to kill each other. The father takes his belt out, like he's about to beat the kids. And at this point, I, I would put a clip in. If I can find it and I'm able to, I'll put it in. It reminds me, <laughs> it just hit my mind, of a joke from Anthony Jeselnik who has a very dark sense of humor, as do I. When I was growing up, I could always drive my dad pretty crazy, you know? I could always tell when he had too much, because he would stand up and take off his belt. And once that belt was in his hands, it was terrifying. Because I knew there was nothing I could say to stop dad from shooting heroin. <laughs> it's such a funny joke. I don't know why it popped into my head. That's, that's what it reminded me of. But he takes that belt. He starts beating the two younger kids. Then the wife attacks him. Then the shotgun comes into play. And Sonny walks in with it and puts it to his father's neck. And then the mob doesn't know what to think. Dolores walks away and says, God, what's happening to us? Now, I get it. The forces in the house are obviously affecting all of them in some way or another. But I can always guarantee you the father was an absolute abusive douchebag before he moved into this house. And matter of fact, I'll throw in, I'm sure Sonny and Patricia probably banged before they moved into this house too. So after that fantastic night, they end up going to church the next morning. Not the father though. So she's talking to the priest and asks him to come bless the house. And then says, you know, my, my husband's a good man. He's just not a church-going guy. A good man? He beat your ass last night and your kids. I'm sure if this guy walked even into a church, he would probably immediately explode into a bunch of liquid shit. That's probably why he never goes to church. So the priest comes over to the house to bless it. And Anthony immediately has an issue with this and becomes his douchebag self like usual. Hits his kid in front of the priest. This guy gives zero shits. Uh, then an outburst from the demonic forces happens in the kitchen, and all the plates and utensils are flying all out of the shelves. Again, why? Why does a demon have to do this? can it just possess him now? I do love, though, how Dolores puts her foot down to her husband. And knowing that he's fully capable of just hitting her if she says what she's about to say. But she says to him, you are going to come with me and the children down to that church. And you're going to apologize in front of your kids to him for how you treated him. Or else I'm leaving. Like, I'm leaving tonight and I'm never coming back. Good for her. Now, when it comes to horror films that revolve around religion... Like that whole religious subgenre of horror. I'm not big into it. There's classics and even masterpieces in that subgenre. I don't think I have to name some of them. But mostly because it doesn't really hit me hard because I don't know what I consider myself. I guess maybe a atheist leaning agnostic <laughs> is the best thing. So None of this affects me on any type of spiritual, emotional level, like anything to do with religion in any horror films. But like always, I always can put myself into the character's shoes and just imagine what they're going through. So through that, I can experience religion, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I also really like how they incorporate him hearing voices into this movie, which... The real DeFeo said he was hearing voices also. In the scene after he puts the gun up to his father's neck, you see him in his room listening to headphones, and he takes them off, and you hear a whisper, you know, why didn't you pull the trigger? This is where Sonny actually becomes possessed by the demon. It takes 36 minutes for Amity to the possession to actually possess, but the whole sequence is shot beautifully it looks eerie as shit a lot of dutch angles and i love the upside down angle on on uh sonny's face when he's seeing this unseen 
demonic force coming after him. Uh, then this is another reason I love this movie and prefer it over the original, is the practical effects. Like when his chest is going in and out and in and out, and that's what actually possesses him, that looks awesome. I don't know why a demon would do this. Like, doesn't that hurt the, the body of the host that you're trying to get into? And then the way everything is filmed after he gets up off the bed, and he looks now like kind of a demon, not fully, but you can see he looks different. This is 82, which I always call the year of the bladder effect, <laughs> with the back of his head that's pulsating with the bladder effect there. You saw that in, like, so many 82 movies. The Beast Within is a very good example of that. Very cool green lighting on him when he's standing there. And then there's some cool shots, like the doors are slamming in the house. This now makes sense for me, because now he's possessed, so he... It's causing all this craziness. But then guns in the basement, they got a lot of guns, are shooting off at random. A bed in the bedroom is spinning around a top-down shot. That's really cool. The power line or something goes down. Wouldn't people hear just the bullets going off alone? Which brings me to a point. Even though I've said the Amityville horror has been debunked with the Lutzes and stuff. Still pretty much debunked with the fail too, but it is very strange that all the family members, none of them woke up. And they didn't have any drugs in their system, they weren't drugged or anything like that. So that is one aspect that still, I guess, is unexplainable, that I can't explain, that not many people get. Why they didn't wake up after hearing, you know, gunshot after gunshot from a, a shotgun. It's not just a normal gun didn't have a silencer none of them heard it and none of the neighbors heard it and not a fucking person a neighbor no one heard any of the explosions going there's explosions <laughs> that are coming out of the cellar down power lines the lights are flickering all over the place the guns are going off and then he just walks into Patricia's room and says, oh, hey, like, when did you get home from the <laughs> from the church? No one heard any of that. I said, I've been to the Amityville house. There are houses very close on both sides of it. So do not tell me that no one heard any of that sound. Then we get the infamous scene with the incest. And yeah, he gets in bed with her and they, they have sex. Looks like it's kind of forced onto her but then she goes and confesses the next morning to the priest and she says that he wants to hurt god so does she know he's possessed like she says something weird's going on with the parents and that the mom don't want to fuck the husband anymore and who, who could blame her but i don't think she knows he's possessed and she's not possessed right <laughs> like i know the house and like the demonic force was affecting all of them we see that in the scene when he goes and points the gun at the father and how the father's big outburst and everything hitting the kids. So is that the reason that she just easily takes her top off like for her brother and <laughs> and everything? It's such a weird scene, it doesn't matter. Moving past that bundle of joy of a topic. Cool scene when the priest comes back over and you get some shots of Sonny looking more possessed and he's like having a riot and everything that's happening with the priest here. He goes to bless her bed and then there's a whole bunch of blood there and pouring from the thing he's holding to bless it with. And then he goes and like pukes in the sink. <laughs> All of that looks really cool. And as usual, for those of you watching the premiere, well, we're almost done actually. All right. The scene when the priest is walking on Ocean Avenue and then he stops. He's across the street. So he's not standing right in front of the house. He's across the street from the Amityville house. And he looks at it and then you know, looks away and continues. It looks good. But it couldn't be more the exorcist if it tried to win an exorcist shot replica award. I can't look at that without immediately thinking of the exorcist. I complete random tangent here. But they're singing at... His birthday party, Sonny's. They're saying, you know, happy birthday to you. You look like a monkey and you smell like one too. But they don't sing it that way. 
they switch it around at the end. They say you smell like a monkey and you look like one too. I've never heard it like that. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say it like that. It's always been look, uh, then smell. I <laughs> This has nothing to do with anything, but I really want to know if anyone else has heard it that way or says it that way, because I've never in my life outside of this movie, and I never remember picking up on it except for this watch. So definitely let me know what you say with that phrase. Alright, like what I was saying earlier in the, the, the stupid incest scene between the two of them, how it she portrays it almost at first. Like, maybe I guess it's, like, disbelief at, like, what's going on. But, like, how it looks kind of a little forced. But I forget, she comes in when he's really starting to look like a fucking hideous demon. And again, the makeup effects look great in this movie. She asks him, is he guilty? And she says, I'm not. So she's... That was consensual, and she's fine with all this. Like I said, they've probably been banging forever. <laughs> and then we get... The whole sequence of Sonny going around killing his entire family. It's very disturbing, the way it's shot. You don't see the younger ones, like, get directly shot. It's off screen, but you see the girl, like, the, the youngest daughter, run past and off camera, then hear the gunshot, and she's dead. Like, it, those gunshots, man, they really hit, especially knowing this really happened in real life. Loosely, as I keep saying, they were all awake during this, which in the actual events, they were all sleeping, but it's not going to be as exciting <laughs> if you have it in your movie where they're all just laying in bed and you have no type of drama going on. If only there was a more modern horror film that started with the boring actual event version of that but the nice little final chase sequence because of course patricia is the one that's the last one to die that chase sequence with him going after her and then finally shooting her and killing her also it's very well done but who's he gonna beg now then the police are all at the house and the main priest guy comes over and they're taking the each one out in body bags and he just walks up and to the body bag and says, don't worry, I'm a priest, it's fine. And then they let him open the body bag and stuff. Does that happen? Could a priest just walk up on a homicide here and just say, it's all right, I'm a priest. And then be able to touch a body? I mean, he doesn't touch the body, but he like blesses their body. But I don't know the priest procedure when it comes to police work and if they're allowed to just walk up and priests are allowed to just go walk onto a crime scene because they're a priest if you're a priest out there listening let me know are you fucking kidding me they even say it after the <laughs> i paused right before this line the priest is walking around the side of the building after the body bag thing and he finds the crucifix that we see a few times in this movie on the ground up against the house and he goes and he starts touching it and one of the cops says, Father, can you not touch anything? This is a crime scene. But yet he was just allowed to play with the body bag. And <laughs> Come on. Then the priest makes eye contact with Sonny when he's being handcuffed and put in the police car. And he says to the priest, I don't remember. Like, I don't remember. So he doesn't remember of any recollection of killing his whole family, which is what DeFeo said in real life. Now... The priest goes to visit him in his cell, and I'm so happy that they wrote it this way and had the warden, whoever it is, cop with him that has authority, shuts this shit down and doesn't let him take this guy out of here because he claims that he's possessed by a demon. If that's how they got him out of here, out of jail... To get to the finale of this movie, I would be pissed every time I watch this film. But thankfully, I mean, it is cool when he licks the crucifix and, like, it burns his tongue or something like that. And the guy with the priest, he seems alarmed. But then he says, like, I gotta take him for an exorcism. He's like, you're saying let this guy go? No. And I'm so thankful for that. I forget the actor who plays Sonny, but he did a great job at the end of that scene after the guy leaves the priest alone with him for a few more minutes 
when he's talking like the demon, like the demon has come out and is talking to the father. It's creepy, man, that he did a great job with his mannerisms and everything. Then they went for another Exorcist Shot Replica Award with an even closer shot to the iconic one for the Exorcist, because now it's nighttime. Only difference is, again, he's across the street, not right in front of it, and it's snowing. Yeah, speaking back to a little bit ago when I said I like how he didn't just let him out of jail, I forgot how stupid the way he actually does get him out of there is. He guilt trips this guy into sending off one officer so that the priest is able to just escape with Sonny out of there. There's no other officers around. There's no other obstacles between them and getting out of here. Are you kidding me? Even the, the stairs they're going down has a sign, restricted area, keep out. You'd think there would be an officer somewhere in view. and they just it, That's stupid as shit. I'm sorry. I mean, so this priest doesn't have the authorization from the church to do an exorcism. But he helps them escape. They go to a church, and then Sonny leaves the church and goes back to the house, which is where he performs his exorcism, and the demon goes into the priest. Oh, also, for some reason, they go back to the weird sex plot <laughs> with Patricia during the possession right before, you know, it, the demon transfers to the father, where Sonny turns into Patricia and starts saying, now it's time for you to confess. And when I gave you my confession, like, you you thought about having sex with me and stuff like that. It, it's so weird, man. <laughs> All the, like, weird sex stuff in this film. I, I, I don't get it. And when you want to make a possession film, uh, then have an exorcism and see the demon come out of somebody, this is how you do it. I mean, again, the effects in this movie are fantastic. With Sonny's face splitting apart and melting off of his skeleton. And there's like a demonic creature with sharp teeth and green eyes under it. Like, all of that looks so good. But, how do you explain that? He looks totally fine. His face is not fucked up or anything. The next morning, when they, or whatever this is, they come and arrest him again. His whole face ripped apart. So, when the demon transfers to the priest, it puts his whole face back together. So, so, I don't know. And then, yeah, we see the priest with the demon claw <laughs> in the house. It exploded. There was a huge explosion. So, I mean, yeah, he does look like he has scars on his face. That he's burnt to some way. But whatever, he's possessed by a demon now. We never find out what happens to this guy, right? Like, I've never seen past Amityville 3D, the third one. I've never seen past the third one. There's, what, like 20-something of these movies? Are you serious? I had enough suffering going through all the puppet masters, 15 of those, and I never saw past, coincidentally, the third movie in that series before I did that. So I don't know if this guy ever comes up again, but he's now a demon, and, yeah, the for sale sign is up, and the Lutzes will move in in the original film. So that's Amityville 2, The Possession from 1982, it's just such a different film from the original in almost every way. And it kind of reminds me of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. How just on the total opposite sides of the spectrum those two movies are. And those are both directed by Toby Hooper. These are different directors, so it makes a little more sense. But it reminds me of that. But the acting's... Good to, there's some great scenes in here. I wouldn't say the acting's great in this movie, but like I said, the father, he, he does a great job, unless he really is in real life an abusive motherfucker and he's just a evil dude and he doesn't have to act at all. I love the feel of this movie, the tone of it, the look of it, all the practical effects look great to this day. The weird sex and incest stuff in this movie, I mean, I can take it or leave it. And I just feel like it's more eventful overall. But fun as hell to watch. So as soon as I saw this, I said, I'm watching this right now. But I hope everyone's having a great morning, afternoon, or night. I will talk to you soon. This has been a Horror After Dark podcast.
Take care, everybody.